So you all doing all right this morning? Amen. Again, Lord bless you for coming out this morning. I've entitled this morning's message, When What You're Doing Isn't Working. When What You're Doing Isn't Working. We can find ourselves feeling a lot of things when we're trying to do something and it, and it isn't working. Most of us have felt that way at one time or another, and I'd uh, adventure to say that uh, there's probably some of you that feel that way right here, right now, maybe about a job or maybe you were going to lose that weight. I knew it would get quiet. Or maybe your business or your walk with God uh, isn't going like you wanted it to and you feel stuck or disappointed or tired. Or maybe you feel a little bit of all those things. But the question is, you know, what do we do when what you're doing isn't working? And I want to cover these principles this morning. As most of you know, I speak pretty quickly and I burn through scripture pretty quickly. This is recorded online. You can come back and watch it. But amen. Let's begin with one. Number one, you got to stop ignoring it or making excuses for it. Jump in and confront what's happening and devise a plan for a chance at a different outcome. Don't allow fear to cause you to do nothing. What do you do when what you're doing isn't working? You got to stop ignoring it, number one, and you got to uh, stop making excuses for it, and you got to jump in and confront what's happening and devise a plan that might give you a different outcome. And again, don't allow fear to cause you to do nothing. That's often the way that, that it goes. There's a situation and we're doing something maybe and it hasn't been working, but we don't really want to confront the issue or what's happening, so we ignore it or we put it out of our mind or we make an excuse for it. But, but how much time has to go by? Some of you may be saying, but Pastor Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. And I have a question right there. Is that the experience you're having in your waiting time? Are you experiencing renewed strength? Are you mounting up and flying through? Are you running your race without weariness? If not, then maybe it's time to confront what's happening and stop ignoring it or making excuses for it. Don't let fear keep you frozen. Confront it. Get a plan to change it and take action. Again, faith without works is dead. Forty days in a row before David uh, got his slingshot out and confronted the giant, the nation of Israel did something that had no chance to solve the giant problem they were facing. They did nothing. Nothing except complain and predict their demise. Did you see this giant that has come out? Surely defeat the nation of Israel when they were the people of God. They were empowered by God to kill every giant that they faced. But the truth of it was, for 40 days and 40 nights, this giant would come until one teenager jumped up with a slingshot and a rock and recognized that he was anointed by God and that he changed the situation. What the prodigal son was doing wasn't working, so he devised a plan. He didn't make excuses for the life he was living. He stopped ignoring what was happening. He was tired of hanging out with the pigs, and he said, you know, I think if I go back to my father's house and say, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Then I think that there's plenty to eat in my father's house. I, I believe that God will intervene and save me. And how many know when he was a long way off. His father saw him and he ran to him and he put a robe upon his back and a ring upon his hand. Why did he do that? Because he recognized what I am doing is not working. And when he recognized that, he said, why should I keep going down this path? And that's my question to some of you this morning. Why do you continue to go down a path if it isn't working? Why not say, you know what, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to confront this situation. 
person and I'm not going to live like this another day or another hour or another year and I'm going to get a plan from God and I'm going to, he's going to turn my morning into dancing. I'm not going to live like in grief and despair and anxiety anymore. I'm going to confront this thing. I'm going to go to the river and I'm going to get out a rock and I'm going to slay this thing. It's not going to uh, hold itself over me anymore. The four lepers outside of Samaria concluded that they had been, what they were doing wasn't working, so they devised a plan. Remember the four lepers and kings? The Bible says there was a drought, and they were outside the city of Samaria, and they were starving to death because there was a drought. And they said, you know what? If we go back into the city, we're going to die. And if we stay here, we're going to die. Maybe if we go into the enemy's camp, we might die, but we might live. That's called deductive reasoning ladies and gentlemen there was a recognition I can't stay where I am I can't go back to where I've been so I bet if I can go someplace I've never been is something bad may happen but something good may explode on the scene and my life be changed because of it and how many know that's exactly what happened the four friends of the man who was paralyzed. They're trying to get through to the door to Jesus, but it wasn't working. They didn't make an excuse and go home. One of them said, how about the roof? With a rope tied to his bed, we can rip the roof off and lower him down. You're seeing the principle here. They were saying, you know what? What we're doing isn't working. Our two choices are just go home or let's get a plan that we can get to Jesus, baby. Let's devise a plan that this is not going to be our outcome that we are going to have an encounter with the living God and if I stumble around in the dark I will if I gotta climb up and tear the roof off I will if I gotta run through a troop and leap over a wall I will because nothing is going to stop me from getting to him will somebody give God a hand clap of praise this morning that you're coming to Jesus no matter what when what you're doing isn't working. What about the woman with the issue of blood? 12 years. What she was doing wasn't working. The Bible said she'd already gone to every doctor and spent all of her money. And she wasn't getting better but just kept getting worse. I'm all for doctors. I go to them all the time. But listen, there's some things doctors can't fix, honey. There's some things that doctors aren't going to take care of. There's some things that nothing less than a touch from a living Jesus is going to change. And that's all there where, uh, is to it. Just concede that he is the answer to your situation. She just kept getting worse, but she said within herself, she began to make a plan. I know if I push through the crowd and I touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'm going to be made whole. How many know sometimes you got to push? Sometimes you got to shove. So sometimes you got to fight. Sometimes you got to cry. Sometimes you got to sweat. Sometimes you got to get up when you're tired. Sometimes you just got to push your way through. And that's exactly what she did. And when she touched the hem of his garment, the Bible says immediately she was made whole in that very hour. When tragedy struck the life of Job and he lost his children and his health and his wealth, sitting around uh, cursing the day he was born wasn't working. So he made a decision and the decision was that he was going to pour into people around him. So in Job 42, the Bible says that Job prayed for his friends. And when he made that decision to take a break from his own grief and pour into other people, God turned the captivity of Job and he gave him twice as much as he had before. Listen, you may not feel like there is a comeback in your future, but God sent me here this morning to tell you that there is. You may feel like you're down to nothing. And if you are, if you are let me just tell you that's all that God needs. When Elisha asked the widow in 2 Kings 4 what she had in the house to pay her debt and prevent her two sons from being sold into slavery, her response was, I have nothing. I have nothing. And out of her little nothing drop of oil, God multiplied it to fill the empty vessels of every neighbor she had. If you'll jump in, ladies and gentlemen, and confront what's happening, you and 
and God will devise a plan that will give you an outcome that's more than you could have imagined. Don't let fear cast your vote. Believe that God is in your last drop of oil, in your last piece of fish, in your last rock, in your slingshot, in your last song, in your prison. And because you've acted by faith and you've confronted your fearful situation, God is going to meet you where you are and he's going to give you an outcome worthy of your faith. Somebody that's a believing for something, will you give God a hand clap of praise? Come on. Talking about what when you're doing, what you're doing isn't working. Number two, you have to develop a willingness to embrace change. Most people don't like change, but it's part of life. In Luke, the fifth chapter, Peter had fished all night, his normal fishing time, the time he always fished. And Jesus asked him to change his routine and launch out during the day and right after an all-night fishing excursion, no less. Peter could have said, I'm the fisherman here, you're the carpenter. He could have said, nah, I'm exhausted, or we've just fi finished cleaning our nets, but he didn't. Instead, he embraced the change at the persistence of the Lord. And he let down his net and he caught a drought of fish so big that it almost sank his boat and the boat of his partner. Why? Because he had a willingness to embrace a change. When God called Abraham, he told him to leave his father's house to a place that he would show him. And if he did, he would make him a great, and he would make his name great, and he would make him the father of many nations. It's important to remember, even though Abraham had this encounter with God, imagine, imagine this. Imagine packing up the U-Haul for you move, and your family is asking, where are you going? And having to answer, I don't know yet. God just told me to pack and start driving but Abraham's willingness to embrace change that was what made him great and it was because of his willingness to embrace change and have faith in God that we now call him Father Abraham the father of many nations you got to be willing to develop an, and embrace change when the Israelites approached the city of Jericho, God spoke an unusual word to Joshua. March around the city once for the first six days. And on the seventh day, march around seven times. Then shout with a great shout because God has given you the city. Joshua was a soldier. He knew battle well. This is not the way you take a city. You take a city by taking a battering ram to the gates. And your soldiers with bows and arrows attacking the men on the walls and sending the swordsmen in after you break down the gate so they can push back the soldiers at close range and let the army in. Marching for six days in silence and then marching seven times the seventh day and shouting is not the way we've ever won a battle before. But Joshua was willing to embrace the change and he told his battle-hardened soldiers be quiet and march around around once for six days and on the seventh day seven times and then shout with a great shout and how many know when they shouted with a great shout that the walls fell down flat and God's people took the city somebody it's a God is asking you to change and if you'll change he'll take you places you've never been Jacob had made up his mind about change. He was not a person of good character. He'd stolen his brother's birthright from a dying and blind father as he pretended to be the older brother. The deception included gluing animal skin to his arms to make it appear he was hairier and older like his brother. But one night Jacob got a hold of God and he wrestled with him all night and he didn't let go until he was changed from Jacob the deceiver to Israel, the prince with God. The change was painful. The Bible tells us his hip was thrown out of joint as he wrestled. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, if you want change, it's painful sometimes. It hurts to get healthy sometimes. But if you'll hang on to God and you'll go after God 
like you've got your hair on fire. I'll stand here and prophesy change will come. And the change that happens will be so miraculous and so great it'll blow your mind and the mind of everybody that knows you. Because that's the nature of our God. Listen to me. Learn to embrace change because everything changes but Jesus. He's the only thing that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I am the Lord God and I change not. Some of us live our life like everything is going to remain the same and Jesus is going to change into whatever little stage of life we're in. But it doesn't work that way. The earth rotates around the sun, and the sun does not rotate around the earth. How many know that we are earthen vessels? Come on, somebody. We're supposed to move around the sun, S-O-N, so he can shine his light on every inch of us. That's what happens when we embrace change. Jesus is the center of our universe, and his love is like the gravitational pull that still holds us in place as we're moving and turning. His light is pushing back the darkness that is trying to hide us from his presence, but it can't. And as soon as darkness is shadow, uh, darkness is shadowing a part of us, we're changing into a new position that exposes the darkness and pushes it back because of the sun. Change prevents darkness from ever setting in. Because of change, it is always being pushed back by the sun. Darkness never lasts. It has a season. But the sun is always shining, so the light that shines upon us is all about position. David said he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, but he feared no evil. He said, because thou, God, art with me. Did you know that shadows can only exist in light? Come on, somebody. So David wasn't afraid of the darkness because he knew it was the light was there beside him. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you are, if you too are walking through a dark time, just remember it's a shadow, and shadows don't exist without light. Just like David, you're going to get through it, and you're going to walk right out into the light of the sun. Life has changed for the good, and big God things are ahead of you and don't you forget it. Abraham's life changed at a hundred years old in ways he couldn't have possibly imagined. David's life as a teenager, teenager changed in a drastic way at the toppling of a single giant. Peter went from a fisher of fish to a fisher of men. Peter was Pentecost preacher and saw 3,000 people merge into the ocean to be baptized after his message. A life of purpose and destiny. Develop a willingness to embrace change. Whether you embrace it or try to resist it, it's coming. And it's going to happen either way. Believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. Because a supernatural God is on your side. And he's made plans for you according to Jeremiah 29, 11, And they're plans filled with hope. And they're good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. He said he would never leave you and he would never forsake you. He said the weapons formed against you are not going to prosper. He said he'd make you the head and not the tail above and not beneath. He said greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. He said a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but none are going to come nigh your dwelling place. He said all things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. He said in the world there will be trouble but fear not for I have overcome the world. He said he'd give strength to the weak and power to the powerless. He said you'd run and not grow weary and you'd walk and not faint. He said he'd 
be your very present help in your time of trouble. He said you'd be hard pressed on every side but not crushed. He said though you'd be persecuted, you would not be abandoned. He said sometimes you'd be struck down but you'll never be destroyed. He said all things are possible. He said your tears may have endured for a night but joy cometh in the morning. He said we'd make a way where there was no way. Embrace the change because there's God things ahead of you and he never changes. Somebody give God, come on, a hand clap, a praise. The third principle, talking about what you're doing isn't working. Ask yourself, could this be just about the timing of God? Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it isn't a sin issue, an intelligence issue, a spirituality issue. Sometimes it's just the timing of God. You feel excited and confident. You're doing the right thing, but it hasn't happened yet again. Could it just be about the timing of God? Ecclesiastes 3.1 tells us there is a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Isaiah 60.22, God promises the smallest one will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it. Act quickly in its time. Some things are nothing more than the timing of God. Maybe what you've been praying for isn't not going to happen. It is going to happen. Maybe it's just about the timing of God. Some things are just about God's timing. Again, in Luke 5, when Jesus told Peter to launch out in the deep for a drought, he was basically fishing in the same place. He'd caught nothing just hours before, but now in God's timing, he catches the biggest drought of fish of his career. When God spoke to Abraham, he was 99 years old and Sarah 90 respectively. And he said, about this time next year, you're going to have a son. I mean, what changed physiologically that year? Nothing changed. The only thing it was was the timing of God. In John 11, Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus about the illness of their brother Lazarus, but Jesus didn't come when they wanted him to because he wanted to show them something about the timing of God. The timing of God can expand our minds in the areas of faith in ways we could have never imagined. The timing of God allows us to grow in faith as Abraham did. And it allows us to see things we've never seen before like Martha and Mary did. How many know that Lazarus got up out of his grave? They hadn't seen that before. Why? Because God was showing them your timing isn't my timing. But when my time comes, baby, I can make Make it all good because I'm God. How many believe in the timing of a living God is working for you and not against you? You can do better than that. A timing of God. Come on. Don't let me preach better than you respond this morning. Amen. I often tell the story of the dream that Smith Wigglesworth had. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, when he was... uh, Early on in ministry, most of you that know him, he has documented, I believe it's 19 people that he raised from the dead. Uh, A a miraculous, supernatural ministry for sure. And he had gone to sleep one night, and in his dream, he saw himself walking along the beach on a road that he typically walked uh, early in the morning to pray. And in his dream, there was an orange VW bug. And it was turned upside down, and he went to the woman that was in the bug, and she was then pulled out of the car, and he laid hands on her, and she came back to life. So the next morning, he went on his usual walk. He's walking down the road. It's the very road that he sees in his dream, and he looks up, and there's a VW bug turned upside down with a woman he can tell is inside, and ambulance has just arrived. The only thing different in his dream was when he saw the the dream, the bug was orange, but when he was walking, physically walking there, the VW bug was red, thinking, you know, that's pretty close given all the other circumstances, type of car, and so on. So he runs up to the ambulance, who has now pulled the woman out of the car and has 
uh, put her in the back of the ambulance and pronounced her dead. <clears throat> and so he jumps in the back of the uh, ambulance and he begins to rebuke the spirit of death and they're all standing there shocked. And he spends about 25 minutes praying for this girl and she does not come back to life. And he's devastated. He doesn't understand it. God, why show me this vision? Why I see all these things and then I come here and this be like this? So he distraughtly leaves the, leaves the place where he was uh, at in the ambulance and he begins to walk and he walks about 100 yards uh, down the road and they're finishing up. And when he turns back, he looks. And when he looks, the sun is coming up over the ocean, and it shines on the red car, and it turns it to orange. And when he does, and it turns it the color of his dream, then he goes back, and he runs, and he pushes them all out. And they said, we've already done this one time. And he lays hands on the girl, and she pops up back to life. And she's raised in that very hour. You can't tell me that the, the timing of God isn't significant. The timing of God, ladies and gentlemen, may be all that it is in your situation. Maybe it isn't that what you're doing isn't working. Maybe it just appears that it isn't working. Working because God is about to launch you into the deep, into the same place you've caught nothing, but now it's the timing of God. Maybe you've been trying to catch the move of God, but before that happens, God has to catch you. Get your attention. Prove to you that you can't do it without him. Prove to you that when he touches the bread, the, the not enough is more than enough. Prove to you that he's just waiting for the seed that has fallen to the ground to die because when it dies, then it's empowered to produce much fruit. Before it dies, it's just a funeral. After it dies, it's a resurrection. That's what he proved to Martha and Mary at the tomb of Lazarus. It it was about the timing of God because to heal him would have proved his power, but to raise him would reveal his glory. If you can't believe, he said, you shall see the glory of God. Could this just be the timing of God? Somebody that know your time is in the hands of God. Come on. The fourth principle is you have to ask yourself, are you all in? I preached about this last Sunday, but this keeps being an urgency in my spirit when I kneel down to pray. Ask yourself, are you all in? That's the only way we can be sure that we're not getting in God's way. Did you hear that? The only way that we can be sure we're not going to get in God's way is we have to go all in. If you're not all in, God is going to trip on you or you're going to trip on him. Don't trip. Turn to somebody and tell them, don't trip, baby. Don't trip. Listen to James 1, 6 through 8, says that he that wavers is like, is wavers is like a wave that is blown by the wind and tossed. Let not this man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable and not some of his ways, but all his ways. All of his ways. That what should this man expect to receive from the Lord? The Bible tells us he should expect to receive nothing. You got to get that in your spirit. You have to ask yourself, are you all in? What's the one thing? Are you 80% in? Are you 90% in? I've given this example before, but here's my wife. If I went to her before I married her or now and said, baby, I'm 90% in in the marriage, you know what I would hear? I would hear the door being shut in my face. That's what I would hear. You know why? Because it's all or nothing, baby. It's all the way, all the time, or nothing. That's the way our relationship with God is supposed to be. How do we know that? Revelation, Jesus speaking, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You know what happened with COVID? It made a lot of Christians lukewarm. Amen? The warm bed is better than getting up and lifting your hands in the house of God. Honey, I'm just going to tell you in love, it don't work that way. You better kick the tire and light the fires because God is coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle. So it's time that we get ignited and fired up and hungry for him. Somebody will you really give God? Come on. 
If those of y'all that can't say amen, just say oh me and do better. Amen. Listen, Samson was the strongest guy in the world. And when he was all in, he was unstoppable. But because he wasn't all in, he was vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Hear me. And what ended up happening is he lost his strength. He got bound up. He lost his vision. And he walked around in circles till the day that he died. What he was doing wasn't working because he wasn't all in. Something else had caught in his eye. For him, it was a woman. For other people, it's money. For other people, it's power. For other people, it's other things. But listen, God is calling us back to being all in, ladies and gentlemen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. If Jesus is anywhere but first place in your life, you're wrong. You are absolutely, unequivocally, totally wrong. Lukewarm is a terrible, dangerous place to be. Don't do that. Pray that God is going to light you on fire and he's got the only bucket in the kingdom. Come on. And you're going to serve him with everything that you have. The nation of Israel rocked around in the desert for 40 years because they weren't all in. Joshua and Caleb were all in, but the leaders of the other 10 tribes were not all in because of fear and low self-esteem. Yes, the promised land is good, just like uh, God said it was. But you know what? The sons of Anak, the giants are there. And we are grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we are in their sight. See what self-esteem can do? Low self-esteem, ladies and gentlemen, can keep you in a desert that you don't belong in. Imagine you are created in the image of God. God has made you a promise. Get over the Jordan and go possess the land that God has given you. Come on. Probably scared a few people off right there. Esther, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't affecting the lives of her people when she was hiding in the king's house. Let me just say, there's people in every church hiding in the king's house. Hallelujah. (laughs) Esther wasn't affecting the lives of her people when she was hiding in the king's house. She only secured their future and hers. When she went all in, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to see the king. I'm going to go in. I know if he doesn't touch me with the golden scepter because I haven't been summoned, but you know what? I don't care because you know what? This is a slow death. I'd rather death die quick or I'd rather have an encounter with God and not worry about death because I'm caught up in everlasting life. Jonah's efforts to flee the presence of God wasn't working. All you Jonah's in the room, you ought to just stop. All the Jonah's online, man, just stop. You're not a good enough swimmer to rebel against God. Just stop it. Jonah's efforts to flee the presence of God wasn't working. The mariners on his boat are rowing as hard as they can in a storm brought on by his own poor choices. It wasn't working, and it wasn't going to work, so Jonah made a decision. The decision was to quite literally go all in. He tells him, throw me in. Throw me in the ocean. And the Bible says in Jonah 1.17 that God had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Notice the preparation that God made for Jonah's deliverance was contingent upon him going all in. Come on, somebody. His deliverance was not on the deck of the boat. It was under the surface of the ocean, which he could not see. When he went all in, the Bible says the storm ceased. Let me just tell you, Jonah, if you you go all in, the storm will cease. And I'll promise you this, your Jesus will get you to the shores of Nineveh one way or another. He's prepared a way. The preparation that God has made for us to get to where we're supposed to be is contingent upon us going all in. Daniel 3. There is no sign of Jesus until the three Hebrew children enter the fire. Didn't we throw three men bound into the fiery furnace? I see four men walking loose and one looks like the Son of God. Come on. 
Notice they didn't encounter Jesus outside the furnace, but when they were all the way in. Then Jesus is there. Then the ropes that bound them fall off. Then they're walking around free. Hello? They had to go all in to see the move of God. Are you bummed out because you haven't seen anything? Here's the thing. Go all in. Jesus is in the furnace. Notice they came out, but Jesus didn't. He's waiting for the next one to enter the fire. In Daniel 6, the angel didn't appear unto Daniel until he was inside the lion's den. Then he sees the angel of the Lord. Then the mouths of the lions are shut. Psalms 46, 1, God is our refuge and our strength and our very present, where? Our very present help in trouble. We're not outside looking at trouble, not worried about trouble in trouble. You got to go all in. And yes, is it trouble? It's trouble. Because here's what's going to happen. Those of you lukewarm Christians that are out there, if we have any, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go all in and then you're going to go, man, I went all in and all hell's breaking loose. But notice all hell is breaking loose. Come on, somebody. Notice it's breaking loose. Ah, you don't hear me this morning. All hell is breaking loose because you're finally in position to get it broken loose. You ought to give God a praise right there. Come on. Come on. The fifth principle. Come on. Enough with the victim mentality. Decide to be courageous. Mm, I know that hurt somebody, and I'm sorry. Enough with the victim mentality. Decide to be courageous. Listen just for a moment. Just to be clear, I'm not making light of anyone's pain. Uh, I know that there's people in here and that I've met throughout the ministry. Unimaginable things happen. Uh, uh, Unimaginable. I can't even wrap my mind around it. I'm not mocking that. Please, if if it feels that way, nothing is farther from the truth. But listen. The fact of the matter is, if you want to live a life worth living, it isn't an option. Courage is a necessity. And listen, you can't live a victim mentality. You have to be courageous. Is it hard? It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done. But it'll be the most rewarding thing you've ever done. In Joshua, the first chapter, this was the very beckoning to God, to Joshua. God acknowledges the elephant in the room. Moses, my servant, is dead. God is just telling, man, I get it. This was your leader. This was the guy I used to free my people from 430 years of slavery. This is the guy to whom I used to open the Red Sea. This is the guy that got water from a rock. I get it. But listen, he's dead. And you're scared about what's ahead. But three times God commands Joshua, be strong and courageous. Joshua, I'm going to take you and this people into my promise. But dude, you're going to have to have courage because there's giants in that land too. We can't enter the promise of God and possess the things that are rightfully ours without courage. And we have to resist the temptation to take on the victim mentality for the bad things that have happened to us. Listen, bad things have happened, are happening, and will happen in the future to us all. But I choose, you and I, we choose whether or not we will be victim to them or victor over them. In Genesis, the 45th chapter, Joseph didn't take the position of the victim. Though he had been sorely mistreated by family, kidnapped, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, lied about by his master's wife about sexual impropriety, imprisoned for years, forgotten about by those to whom he'd interpreted dreams and helped. And yet when he's been redeemed and holds the position of prime minister of Egypt and is now standing in front of the brothers that betrayed him, he says this, He says, don't be angry with yourselves. You didn't bring me here, God did. You did not bring me here, God did, and he did it to save lives. The epiphany Joseph had was here, right here, is that God allowed some bad things to happen to him in order for some great things to happen through him. Come on, somebody. God allowed some bad things to happen to him in order to allow some great things to happen through him, things that will literally save people's lives. 
Ladies and gentlemen, courage is a difficult proposition with, when there's trauma or tragedy or trial. It's so devastating you can't hardly believe, breathe. I've seen pain take people's power, reduce them to nothing more than a broken soul waiting to die themselves. I watched my own aunt that lived next door after losing her son in a car accident. She just stopped living. She was still alive, but she stopped living, swallowed by grief and guilt because, you see, the last word she ever spoke to her son was, I don't have time for you right now. So after his death, Existence was all she ever managed. I personally spent five years drowning in my own grief and sadness and anger over my own injustice. But at some point, ladies and gentlemen, we have to decide, are we going to stand up and slay the giant or are we going to be a slave to it? Because one thing is for certain, we can't have two masters. Jesus said eventually we'll love one and we'll hate the other. I'm sorry for your loss, for your unimaginable grief, for your unfair set of circumstances, for your pain, your wounds, your hurts, your secret misery. But here's the thing. We're either going to stand up and live or we're going to lay down and die. And if we're going to live, then it's going to take a Herculean amount of strength and courage. And let me just interject right here. If your first thought is, I can't do it, let me just quote Isaiah. In Isaiah 40, 29, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Let me just go ahead and quote Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 10 from the Amplified. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly drawing from God's strength. You may feel like you can't do it, but that's not true. You can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loves me and gave himself for me. Take courage. Be courageous. Only be strong and very courageous. Cross the Jordan and see what the promise of God really looked like. I'm not going to live in a victim mentality another hour. I'm going to cross the Jordan hell or high water giants or not if I perish I perish let the king be with me and let's go do it with courage with somebody that plans to be courageous hallelujah The sixth principle, and I've got to hurry this morning. Remember, success is never defined by the amount of times we've fallen, as my wife alluded to this morning, but by the amount of times we rise back up again. We didn't choreograph that. She didn't know. I didn't know. So you, uh, there's a double confirmation. Remember, success is never, ever, never defined by the amount of times we've fallen, but by the amount of times we rise back up again. And let me just tell you all something in love in the spirit wherever you're at whatever you're going through in the name of Jesus get up get up from there you still got living left to do you still got lives left to change get up get up until 1974, Babe Ruth was the most proficient home run hitter in the major leagues. Over the course of his career, he hit 714 home runs until the great Hank Aaron broke his record in 1974. The record stood for 39 years. But what many people don't know was that the babe had another incredible record that stood for 29 years. He struck out 1,330 times. He struck out nearly twice as many times as he hit home runs, but to this day, Babe Ruth is considered one of the greatest hitters of all time. Why? He wasn't afraid to strike out. You know why? Honey, I've got the fence on my mind. I'm going to knock it out of the park. You know what? Nobody's going to remember my swings and misses, but my swings and connects are going to change history. Come on. 
Thomas Edison had over 300 failures before he invented a working light bulb and became the premier name when we think about and talk about electricity. Uh, Edison would never admit to having failed 300 times, and he tells it this way, I just found 300 ways that didn't work. How many know that's optimistic? Come on, somebody. Success is never defined by the amount of times we've fallen, but by the amount of times we rise back up again. Jeremiah 8.4 says this to the people of Judah. If a man falls down, he gets back up. And if he goes the wrong way, he turns around and goes back. That seems pretty simple. Proverbs 24.16, reading in the Amplified. A righteous man falls seven times and rises again. But the wicked stumble in the time of disaster and collapse. Notice God does not define righteousness by the number of times we fall, but by the number of times we rise. In this case, as Jojo said, fell down seven times, rose up eight. Righteous. Righteous, because they got up more than they fell down. Have you fallen down? Get up in the name of Jesus. You can still be right standing with God. Get up in the name of Jesus. And don't lie there and become corrupt by a circumstance. Don't do it. When what you're doing isn't working, try again. When what you're doing isn't working, try again. Peter, I know you fished all night and you're tired, but try again. That, that's basically what Jesus told him. Elijah's simple message to his servant on top of Mount Carmel when he came back and told him there was no sign to indicate the drought was coming to the end. His words to him was, go again. There's nothing. 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 Go again. And on the seventh time, well, I saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand, run to the city because there's coming a mighty rain. Why? Because he knew success would not be defined on how many times he looked. Success will be defined by the time you find, ladies and gentlemen, that will change it all. When blind Bartimaeus didn't get the attention of Jesus, the first time he called out to him again, but louder this time, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't say, well, I tried, but Jesus isn't answering. He said, I'm going to try and keep trying, and I'm going to become more anointing. Annoying, Jesus. I mean, oh, Jesus liked the woman at the unjust judge's door. She just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. Man, I, I don't fear God or man, but give her whatever she wants. When what you're doing isn't working, try again. Get up and try again. Galatians 6, 9, don't grow weary in well-doing for in due season. You shall reap if you faint not. That tells me it's going to happen. Get up and try again. 1 Samuel 30 again, David has been fighting battles against the enemy, but when he gets home, his town is burned to the ground, his family has been kidnapped, his men's family have been kidnapped, and they are so upset and filled with grief, they're talking about stoning him to death. The battles he'd fought hadn't worked in the sense he is worse positioned now than he was. But what God tells him when he's praying, he tells him, pursue. Go fight again. Pursue. You're going to surely recover it all. We know the story. He did pursue, and he did recover it all. He fought again, and that time he recovered all. The seventh principle, and I'm going to close with this this morning. If what you're doing isn't working, then reconnect with God in a more intimate way than ever. I know, other, I know no other way. If what you've been doing isn't working, then connect or reconnect with God in a more intimate way than ever. The answer for the prodigal son was just to reconnect with his father. A mission I've sinned, run back to my father, reconnect. He's safe, plenty to eat. 2 Samuel 12, David is in a state of grief with a, with a deathly ill child, and after a week, the child dies. The Bible tells us after the child died, David washed up, anointed himself, and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Why? Because David knew that the only answer to get him through the grief was to reconnect with God. And ladies and gentlemen, whatever it is you're going through, the only way to get through it is reconnect with God. Have a greater connection with God. Paul and Silas are in the midnight hour experience. What they had done had not kept them out of prison, but in their bondage, they 
they made a decision, I'm going to connect with God. So at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Listen, and the prisoners heard them. Always remember, hurting people are always watching. They're always watching. You know why? Because they're looking for hope. They're looking for somebody that had been broken in a thousand pieces and they made it. That God put them back together and they were better than ever. You're that person. After the disciples watched Jesus die the death of the cross, it appeared what they had done had not worked. Jesus was dead. The next time we see them is they are in the upper room praying, and they kept praying in that room with family and friends for 10 days until they had a reconnection with God, until they made a greater connection with him than they'd ever had before, until they were all filled with his spirit and empowered for his message. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing that I know to do this morning, and if you've fallen asleep, just look at me for the next 10 seconds. The only thing I know to tell you right now that I can promise you is the word of the Lord is God is calling his people to awaken, and he's calling his people back to the altar. That's what he's doing. If you want to see revival in your house, revival in your church, I'll just tell you unequivocally, flat out, you know what it's going to take? It's going to take time. It's going to take time and commitment and prayer to come back to the altar, repent for the wrongs that we have done and the things that we are and the things that we should be and aren't, not because God's mad, but because he loves us so much he wants to build that relationship with us. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. If what you've been doing isn't working, then I have a suggestion for you. Again, reconnect with God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will, God said, I will heal your land. I don't care what CNN, ABC, CBS said. God said, you know what, I'll heal the land. How many know you're from dirt? Come on, I'm from dirt. He'll heal the land. Come on. So this morning, I'm going to ask the guys to put on some worship. I'm going to just sing this uh, uh, worship uh, song, but I'm going to invite you all to come to the altar. If you need to give your life to Jesus, Pastor Tony's here, uh, 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 Pastor Aaron's here. You can give your life to Jesus. They'll walk you through heaven. But you know what? If you need to come and, and, and spend time with God, reconnect, I just invite you because of the word of the Lord to, you know what? Use this time for reconnection before you leave here. Lunch will still be there. Reconnect with God. Those that got to go, God bless you this morning. Thank you for coming out. I'm just going to worship for a little bit. We're opening up the altars. If you want to be on one of the front chairs or something, you can do that. The altar, you can do that. God bless you. I'm not going to be at the back. I'm going to worship this morning. If you want to hang out and worship, you can hang out and worship as well.